Okay, welcome everyone today. Thank you for joining us. My name is Christina Bowman, and I am the Community Accessibility Specialist with the North Carolina Division of Services for Deaf and Hard of Hearing. And um, our office here in Wilmington, we have um, eight plus years of working with the National Weather Service Office, also located in Wilmington, um, a really great working relationship. Uh, last year, they reached out, um, really excited about wanting to put together a webinar learning opportunity about rip currents. And so we're really excited to present this to you today. Next slide. All right, before I do my introductions, um, I just wanted to quickly make sure everyone had a minute to play around and get used to um, some of the options you have to view this webinar. So somewhere towards the top of your screen, you may notice a, a white bar that you can click on and move up and down. Um, and that way, if you want your interpreter to be larger uh, and the PowerPoint to be smaller, you can do that. There should also be two arrows at, towards the bottom right hand of the screen um, that will allow you to click and it'll just move around the way you can view this presentation today. Okay, next slide. Um, so in a moment, I'll be introducing you to our wonderful presenters. We're gonna start with introductions, then we'll have about 45 minutes, give or take, for the RIP Current presentation. And at the end, we'll have time for questions and answers. Um, so while you're watching this webinar, if you think of a question, feel free to enter it. Um, at, or at the end, if you have questions, enter those in the chat box. Um, on the side, on the right-hand side, there's a place to enter your questions. And at the end, we'll go through as many as we can. Um, we'll definitely give ample time for questions and answers. Um, if that column with your chat box is in the way, you can collapse it when you click on that orange arrow at the right um, top hand corner. Okay, so our wonderful National Weather Service presenters here, they are from the Wilmington office and they serve a portion of counties in North Carolina and also several counties in South Carolina. Our first speaker will be Steve Path. And he will be talking about, um, he'll be telling us what a rip current is, why they're so dangerous. Then we'll have Vicki Oliva, and she's gonna give us some important rip current statistics and information. And then we will wrap up with Mike Kochasek, who is going to tell us how to spot a rip current and other important information, uh, what to do if you get stuck, how to stay safe, and so on. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Steve. Okay, thank you, Christina, and welcome everybody. We greatly appreciate you attending to learn more about rip currents. We hope you get something very, uh, very good uh, type of information from us. And uh, just as important, we hope that you share this information with your family, your friends, and your coworkers. And if you think about rip currents and where they're found, right along the beaches in a really narrow area along our beaches, even though they're in a small area, they have significant implications to people all across our country. Because if you think about it, people visit our beaches from not only all across the country, but from all over the world, uh, come on vacation and to have a good time. And unfortunately, uh, sometimes they can run into this hazard, this rip current hazard, and what we see year to year is there are over 100 fatalities along our beaches. And, and, and as far as the Carolinas go, we average about 10 fatalities per year. So just a significant impact. It's the number one weather-related killer in the Carolinas. And uh, thousands of lives are lost each year around the world. So we're going to talk um, you know, about that hazard and about the hazard. We're going to talk about what a rip current is, why they're so dangerous, and so much more. And if you think about when we build the resiliency within our communities and in our nation, we want to build a weather-ready nation. You can have the best technology in the world, the best research, the best tools to use, but if we can't clearly communicate that message to the public 
and uh, have strengths through our partnerships and getting the information out to everybody, then, then we're, we're not doing our job. So uh, building community resiliency needs to be inclusive of everybody so that we can keep people safe. So basically, you know, Christina went through uh, what we're gonna cover today. I'm gonna talk about what a rip current is, the basics, you know, uh, why are they so dangerous, and then Vicki will talk about the, the rip current statistics that are so important. We can learn so many things from these statistics that can help people in the future. And then she's going to talk about the Hurricane Lorenzo rip current event, a real short case study of why that event was so dangerous for the United States. And that occurred last year. And then Mike is going to talk about um, what are the visual clues for spotting and identifying rip currents and then actions you can take if you're caught in a rip current, and what do you do if you see someone else in distress? We don't want you to become uh, a victim either way, so we're gonna give you some ideas um, that you can use. And lastly, where to learn more about rip currents. So what is a rip current? Rip current is the most common beach hazard we have, and the United States Life Savings Association has found through their statistics that 80% of all surf-related rescues are a result of rip currents. So that's the most common thing you're going to run into. Uh, in, again, in the Carolinas, it's the number one weather-related killer. Lifeguards refer to rip currents as drowning machines. They're basically like treadmills that cut through the surf. And if you don't know how to get off of that treadmill, then you're gonna get into danger really quick. A lot of people think that rip currents pull you under. When that's not the case, rip currents pull you away from the coast. The only time you go under is if you don't have the energy to stay afloat or to swim out of the rip currents. You get tired quickly and you can't stay afloat and, and that's when people get into trouble. Rip currents can occur at any beach where there's breaking waves. And that even includes the Great Lakes. So it's a worldwide problem. And we have a lot of beach real estate in our nation, which is why it is a significant hazard for us. Rip currents can be found in the nearshore environment. And this graphic shows the different zones that make up that nearshore environment. From the beach area on the top right, all the way out to the shoaling zone, which is the first zone that waves encounter as they approach the beach. In this area, waves begin to feel bottom, and as a result, they begin to slow down and increase in height. And then when they approach the sandbars right next to the coast, they feel bottom significantly, slow down very fast, and they grow very quickly. And the top part of the wave is moving faster than the bottom part of the wave, so what happens is the wave plunges or spills down and the waves break, which is why we call this the breaker zone. And as waves continue to disperse as they approach the coast, they do that in the surf zone. And the last zone, zone is the swash zone. And that's the interface where the water runs up onto the beach. So that area highlighted in this oval, this is the area where we would find the rip current. And we'll talk more about the components of a rip current shortly, but if you notice, it, it cuts through the entire uh, zone, surf zone and past the breaker zone. It's important to know that this surf zone width changes depending on tides and the waves that are coming into the coast. So if you have swells from a distant hurricane, those are very long period waves. They feel bottom farther offshore, therefore the surf zone is going to extend much farther offshore. And that's very important when it comes to rip currents, and we'll talk about that with this next slide. So the rip current structure is basically three components. There are feeders, which are right next to the shoreline. Sometimes there could be one feeder, but in most cases there's two feeders. So the waves are breaking on the sandbars on the flanks of the rip current that's in the center here. And that water is piling up along the beach and it is uh, being gathered by the feeders and then being directed back away from the coast. So the middle part that cuts through the surf zone is called the neck. And this is an important area because this is the area 
where people actually feel like they're in a rip current. They're either countering the current with their swimming and just enough to stay in one spot, but they're not getting any closer to the beach. Or if the current is strong, and then they actually feel like they're being carried away. So the, the neck area is the point where people feel like they're getting into trouble. And the reason for that is the speeds of the current are greatest in the neck. They could be six to eight feet per second, or about three to five miles per hour. And that might not seem like a lot, but that's actually faster than what an Olympic swimmer can swim at. So even the best swimmer and strong rip currents can run into problems very quickly if we don't know how to get out of the rip current. And the last part of the rip current is the head area here. This is where the, the neck extends through the surf zone and beyond the breaking waves, the current begins to weaken and fan out. What's interesting to note is some research tells us that some rip currents are circulatory, which means they might have a circulation intact. But the same studies also show that rip currents can eject, a certain percentage of rip currents eject people farther offshore. But the length of a rip current can be as long, from the feeders to the head, can be as long as a football field. And that's just a terribly long distance to swim back in if we don't take action as soon as we realize we're, we're in danger. The typical width of a rip current is about 30 feet across. And that's, um, that's fortunate because if you can swim at least 30 feet, you might be able to make it to one of the sandbars where you could possibly touch bottom or in the least use the waves to come back ashore. But Mike's going to have more information about that uh, when we talk about getting uh, it, what do we do if we're caught in a rip current. So rip currents form in different ways, but the, the easiest way to discuss this is if you have a lot of waves moving into an area and piling up on our beaches, it creates an imbalance. And the surf zone tries to balance itself out by uh, when you have mass moving in, it wants to get the mass moving out. So rip currents will intensify if there's a lot of uh, large breaking waves coming into the shoreline. So the waves pile up on the beaches, the water is created uh, created an imbalance, and the natural response is for the water to be carried away by the rip current like we see here in this, this picture. Rip currents can strengthen or become numerous depending on the tide level. At high tide, there's plenty of water over the sandbars that any incoming waves can easily flow back out over the sandbars, and during high tide, rip currents are typically weaker. However, at low tide, the water depth over the sandbar is very limited. It's constricted. It doesn't have the ability to flow back out over the sandbar. So what happens is it follows the path of least resistance, and that is through a break in the sandbars like we see here, and the current is accelerated away from the shoreline. The National Weather Service offices along the coast issue surf zone forecasts, and I'm showing a, a map depiction of the rip current risk on the left-hand side, and the right-hand side is actual text taken from one of the Wilmington Weather Service office surf zone forecasts. The graphical depiction on the left-hand side, the yellow areas indicate the part of the coastline near, near Wilmington and, and Myrtle Beach, uh, farther down to the south where there's a moderate risk. The red areas indicate where there is a high risk of rip currents. And you know, not everybody likes maps and graphics, so a lot of people like to refer to the text forecast, which is available. Some weather offices, these forecasts are, are created year-round. The Wilmington office, the Moorhead City office, the Charleston office were more seasonal. We issue them when they're when the beach season is ongoing uh, to help with our lifeguards and our emergency managers, and as well as the public know about the, the risks that are, that are going on. And in this particular surf zone forecast text, the rip risk is moderate. You can see what the, the, breaker, the breakers are expected to be in the surf, what is the thunderstorm potential, water spouts, ultraviolet index. There's much, much more available to anybody going to the beach other than just rip currents. We wanted to show you that. 
When we forecast rip currents, we look at buoy observations, so we look for wave data. It is so important to know the height of the waves, the period of the waves, and also the angle the waves approach the coastline. Because when we have the conditions in place to support large breaking waves in our surf, I guarantee you that there will be rip currents out there. There's rip currents out there every day, but our job is to identify when they're expected to be numerous or strong to inform the public of that hazard. And you can find more information uh, on the link. Uh, you can just Google um, beach for surf zone forecasts and, and your National Weather Service office and you'll get that information. So why are rip currents so dangerous? Why are 100 people each year losing their lives in the, uh, the beaches of the United States? And there's four main reasons for that. For one, they can be hard to identify. This picture from Carolina Beach back in 2001 shows a rip current, but it's really not that obvious in appearance. And I know you're gonna learn more about how to spot them here shortly, but sometimes the surf can be so rough from waves from wind, from foam, sometimes it can look like a washer machine that it's very, very difficult to spot a rip current. So the best thing to do is if, it's a, if, there's, or if there are lifeguards on the beach is to ask them if they observed any rip currents. And if so, have them point them out to you so you can begin to learn what they look like and spot them on your own. But first and foremost, they can be very hard to identify. Second, they're often encountered by people with little knowledge about them. And this is one reason why we're doing this, this presentation. There are people from across the country on this webinar right now. Uh, the more information we can get about rip current safety, how to spot them, what to do if you're caught in one, those sorts of things, uh, the better prepared people are going to be when they go to the beach. But in some parts of the country, there's very little efforts ongoing to teach people about rip currents. Along the coastal areas, we do a lot of work. We do a lot of work with the Division of Services for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing in, uh, at the Wilmington Regional Center. We work uh, a lot with emergency managers, our local media partners. You know, the Weather Service's strengths are through its partnerships. We, we build and work on these problems together. Sometimes the worst events can occur with the best weather. Imagine a storm several hundred miles off the coast where the, re the weather is extremely bad. Uh, however, right along the coast, the weather is beautiful. There not, might not be a cloud in the sky because the, the, the storm is so far offshore. But what's happening are large swells are being produced by the storm and those swells approach the coast and set uh, conditions that rip currents thrive in. And people often get confused by the fact that the weather is nice, but they can't believe that the surf conditions are terrible. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship. You can have very rough surf with the best weather. And then the last thing, people try to outswim a rip current. They try to swim from the shortest distance from, to get from point A where they're at in the water back to point B, which is at the beach. And oftentimes that's directly right against the rip current. So they stay on the treadmill, they get tired quickly, and they can't remain afloat. So instead of trying to outswim a rip current, it's time to learn how to swim out of a rip current. Swim parallel, get out of the rip current, use the waves after you're out of the rip current to get back to shore. So with that, I'm going to pass over the presentation to Vicki, who's going to talk about some important statistics and the hurricane. Lorenzo event. Let me know when you're ready, Vicki. Okay. I'm good. All right. Well, good afternoon. My name's Vicki. I'm with the National Weather Service in Wilmington. And just want to go over a few statistics and rip current events with you. So as Steve mentioned, nationally, 80% of all rip ocean rescues are rip current related, and there are an estimated 100 rip current deaths a year nationwide. Since 2000 in the Carolinas, there have been more rip related deaths than any other weather hazard. 
This includes lightning, tornadoes, hurricanes. It's the number one weather killer in Eastern North Carolina. So since 2000, there have been 143 confirmed rip deaths in the Carolinas. This estimates to about seven a year. And since 2011, a quarter of those deaths have been bystanders who drowned, make an attempted rescue. Um, so there, in our area, there's a lot of beaches that don't have lifeguards. And unfortunately, this leaves people to, you know, try to attempt to rescue themselves if they see someone in distress. Um, switching gears to gender, the most effective age, most effective age group is males between the ages of 41 and 50 and females from 31 to 40. And male drownings are about five times more than females in the Carolinas. And not surprisingly, 84% of rip current drownings in the Carolinas are people from inland areas. And so, next slide. All right, so two big lessons we can take away from these statistics is one, we need to better reach inland people with rip current awareness. Uh, rip currents may be a coastal event, but they impact people from all across the country. Um, locally, we have people visiting our beaches from Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. Um, you know, these people come from areas that probably don't talk about rip currents a lot. They don't see rip currents on the national TV. Um, their local broadcasts aren't talking about rip current risk. And so we need to be reaching people who vacation at the beach, who visit the beach, you know, every summer. So at the National Weather Service, we're, we're working hard to try to spread rip current awareness as far and wide as we can. And that includes doing webinars such as this one. The second lesson from the statistics is we are we're good at you know educating people how to escape a rip current but we need to you know start addressing how do you like what do you do if you see someone in distress when there's no lifeguards available you know maybe it's after hours or it's on an unguarded beach and so mike will talk about later how you can protect yourself while trying to help someone else so that you don't become you know, a rip current fatality. And so next slide. Oh, thank you. Um, so two of the most dangerous scenarios in our area are long period swells from distant hurricanes and clear weather days following a storm. So many of you probably don't remember Hurricane Lorenzo, uh, you know, category five hurricane last year that you know, didn't didn't come near the United States. It probably wasn't on most people's radar. But unfortunately, Hurricane Lorenzo led to, had devastating impacts on the East Coast, despite being so far away. So next slide. So where was Hurricane Lorenzo? Well, Lorenzo was remained in the Eastern Atlantic from September 23rd to October 4th. The closest Lorenzo got to the United States was over 2,000 miles away. So that's pretty far away. Um, most people, you know, if they saw this, saw the forecast, saw it curve to the north and were thinking, oh, you know, we're good, we're safe. But unfortunately, Hurricane Lorenzo was a slow moving, powerful hurricane and so it generated large ocean swells that moved across the Atlantic to reach the East Coast. So given how far away it was, it took about four days for the swells from Lorenzo to reach the East Coast, where it created dangerous surf and strong rip currents, you know, up and down the coastline. 
all the way from Florida up to New Jersey. So what was the local weather like as you know these dangerous swells were approaching the coast? Well, you know, we had beautiful weather in the Carolinas. Uh, it was sunny, the temperatures were in the 80s, and this was early October. Um, water temperatures were above normal. So, you know, at a first glance, people thought, you know, beautiful beach day. You know, we can get in some late season swimming. Um, just probably looked at the forecast and, you know, it was kind of summer like outside. So we had, you know, abnormally large crowds going to the beaches. And so the combination of these dangerous swells from Lorenzo and the large crowds from the beautiful local weather made a recipe for disaster. And so next slide. All right. So what happened? Well, unfortunately, there were seven surf-related deaths on the East Coast that were attributed to Hurricane Lorenzo swells. Four of these deaths were in the Carolinas, two of which were local deaths at Curie Beach on October 2nd. To, in comparison, Hurricane Dorian, which when you think 2019 hurricanes, you know, Dorian is probably the first one that comes to mind. Her Dorian made landfall in Cape Hatteras, North Carolina, but had zero direct deaths in the Carolinas, while Lorenzo, over 2,000 miles away, had four. And so Lorenzo led to hundreds of recurrent rescues, you know, across the East Coast. And unfortunately, the National Weather Service lost one of our own, Dr. Bill LaPenta, uh, got caught in a rip current in the Outer Banks and unfortunately didn't make it. So none of us are immune to rip currents. And so Lorenzo is a perfect example of how, you know, we don't need a storm to directly impact us to have devastating effects. So just because, you know, the weather's beautiful outside, it's still extremely important to know, know before you go. Check the surf forecast. Um, you know, be sure to swim with, you know, at a beach with a lifeguard. You know, protect yourself as much as possible. Just because the weather's beautiful doesn't mean the ocean is safe. And so with that, I will turn it over to Mike to talk more about protecting yourself with the uh, rip currents. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. There's been a lot of good information shared so far. And if you have any questions for us, at the end, when I'm done showing some real life pictures on the beach of what rip currents can look like, we will have a quick question and answer period. So if you want to chat in the chat box a question that you have for either myself, Victoria, or Steve, we will stick around to answer your questions. So going to the beach, identifying a rip current can be very tough. When I go to the beach, I like to look around before I cross the dunes on the usually the public pier, and I look to see first where I can set up a good spot for my blanket, but second is looking into the water to see where potential problems could be, where the rip currents might lie. So we're gonna share some tips here on some appearances of the waves that might be able to help you spot where some trouble areas may be on the beach. So first is a muddy appearance. If water looks muddy, that might be a problem. Areas with choppy water flowing through the surf, that could be a trouble area. Foam or seaweed, if that's being carried out to sea, that could be a potential indicator. Water in the surf that looks darker than surrounding areas, that could be a concern. And areas where waves don't seem to break could also be a sign that there's trouble lurking. So if we go to the next slide, we'll show here some pictures that show kind of what a muddy appearance might look like in the water. These are real life pictures. And if you look closely where those yellow arrows are pointing, do you notice the area is a little darker than the surrounding areas? 
sometimes it can be very tough. And if you notice, these pictures are not taken from standing right at the water's edge. They're taken from a little bit of a higher angle, either up on a dune or from a lifeguard chair or someone's back porch on their sea house where they can look out and see these images. So they're very difficult at times to notice when you're standing right there on the water's edge. We have these muddy appearances and that's where rip currents are taking away sediment and sand from the beachfront there because they're so turbulent that they're taking away sand and creating that muddy appearance and carrying it further out to sea. So if you see this muddy appearance, that could be a rip current. If we go to the next slide, we will see more examples of rip currents where, do you notice that white foamy look where the waves crash on the beach? If you would take an imaginary line and kind of take it parallel to the beach, there's a certain width of what that white would look like. But do you see where there's bubbles, where the, the, the foam kind of bubbles out, right where those yellow arrows are pointing, where it doesn't really line up with the rest of the white foam on the beach? Those are potential areas where rip currents are developing and taking foam out to sea. And again, if you notice, this might be hard to, to figure out when you're standing right on the beach edge because this picture is taken again from an elevated area looking down on the water where it's a lot more noticeable. So if you're on the beach and you're unsure if what you're seeing is a rip current or not, you can go to a higher ground on a dune, on a pier, or better yet, if there's a lifeguard there, you can ask the lifeguard because they will know where the rip currents have occurred that day. If we go to the next slide, we'll see more examples of rip currents here where there's a difference in color. Do you see in the middle there, that middle arrow where there's a darker area compared to the sides? On the right and the left, there's a little bit of a sandbar there. Those are shallow areas where it's not as deep, so the sun is able to go through the water and hit the bottom. So you can see them a lot easier. But in the middle there, you notice it's darker where the sun can't quite get down to the bottom as easily. That darker area is a near shore channel. And those channels where it's darker are problem areas for rip currents to develop. So if you see that darker color where it's surrounded by lighter colors, that might be an area to avoid. If we go ahead to the next slide, another indicator is where waves don't seem to be breaking. If you look at this picture here, there's a lot of white areas, white beach foam where the waves have crashed. But right there in the middle, where it's a little bit darker and the arrows are pointing, it's there's not a lot of foam, if you notice that, compared to the surrounding areas. Where the waves aren't breaking, that's a sign that that's an active current taking water out to sea. And waves don't typically break in those areas. So if you see an area that looks funny like this, where the waves aren't breaking, that could be a sign that you're looking at a rip current. And sometimes it's tough when you go to the beach on a busy holiday weekend or any weekend in the Carolinas. Oftentimes this will be the area where you can set up your beach blanket and it'll be open, but it can be very dangerous because of that. So again, if you're not sure where to set up a blanket, if you want to avoid rip currents, ask your nearest lifeguard, they can help you. If we go ahead to the next slide, Here's another example of rip currents where there's no breaking waves. Now this picture is taken a little bit lower, maybe eye level to where you would be standing on the beach further back on a dune or higher up the beach. 
So you can see what it might look like from eye level where on the left and the right sides, there's that white foam again where the waves are breaking. But right there in the middle, it's very dark. And that middle part is a potential trouble area where the waves aren't breaking, indicating that there's water rushing there, a rip current, very dangerous. If we go ahead to the next slide, let's pretend that we're in the water now. So this is our friend from Wrightsville Beach Ocean Rescue in North Carolina. His name is Dave Baker. And he has rescued many people over the years that have been caught in rip currents. And he often says that people say, once they're rescued, that they didn't realize they were in a rip current until it was too late. And they were being pulled back from shore. So how do you know if you're in a rip current? Well, the beach will start to look smaller and smaller as you're getting pulled outward. A common misconception is that they, you will be pulled under if in a rip current. And generally they don't pull you under the water, they just pull you further from shore. So let's pretend that we're Dave. We're in the water and we're swimming and we're being pulled further from the water here. So we have three different directions that we can go. We can go with option A or option B or option C. Many people choose because they don't realize they're in a rip current, they choose option B and they try to swim towards the water or back to shore. They're fighting the rip current and they don't realize that they're in a rip current until they start feeling very tired and probably realize they're not moving anywhere. So the best option is not to swim back to shore if you notice that you're not moving when you're swimming or that you're being pulled further and further from shore. Your best options are to swim parallel to shore, either option A or option C, and swim parallel to shore. That way you can get out of the rip current. Most rip currents are not that wide they are probably only about 30 feet wide. So if you do swim options A or C parallel to shore, you can escape the rip current. It's hard to relax, but as you're being pulled, the best option is to tr just try to relax and swim out of the rip current by swimming parallel. That is your best option. If we go to the next slide here, Speaking of options, you can either swim parallel to shore, right or left, out of the rip current, or if you're too tired to swim, save your energy by floating in the rip current and waving to shore for help. The rip current will take you out, not under, and it'll just pull you further from shore, but eventually you can swim out of it once you get back outside to the right or the left and the incoming waves will help you return to shore by their momentum pushing forward towards the beach. So if you're caught in a rip current, try to relax because it won't pull you under. Don't swim straight back to shore, swim parallel to shore to the right or to the left and try to wave for help on the beach. Somebody will be there I'm sure to help. Don't swim alone. If you're swimming alone, there's a better chance that people will not be able to hear you or see you. So if we go to the next slide here, if you see somebody in distress, because not everybody that likes to go to the beach likes to go in the water. And if you don't know how to swim, that's probably best. But if you happen to be on a beach and you see somebody that's having trouble, the best option is to get help from a lifeguard. So when you go to the beach, make sure you can see your nearest lifeguard so you know where they are in case you need to reference them. If there are no lifeguards, you can always call 911 and they will send somebody to help there on the beach. If you can, because a lot of times people begin to panic when they're in rip currents, Help the victim understand what they need to do. If you can scream at them, 
let them know to swim to the right or to the left, sideways, parallel to shore, so that they can escape the rip current. If possible, and you have a flotation device with you, instead of jumping in the water, if you don't know how to swim, the very least you can do is throw them, if you can, a flotation device that they can latch onto and help them stay above water because they will get tired fighting the rip current. And if you are a swimmer and you want to try to attempt, which we don't recommend, but if you want to try to attempt to help, never go in the water without yourself, by yourself without a flotation device. If you're by yourself, which we also don't recommend, if you go swimming, take a flotation device with you. If we go to the next slide, key tips for safety is if you do go in the water, know how to swim. If you don't know how to swim, it's probably best that you don't go into the ocean because the ocean is not like a swimming pool. It's a lot more turbulent. There's lots of waves and they always look bigger once you're in the water than they did on the beach. If you're unsure, swim near a lifeguard and they will be able to watch over you as you swim and have fun at the beach. Never swim alone. Always go with your friends and family. That way, if you do go in the water and have trouble, somebody will know that you're having trouble and can get help. Have something, having some kind of flotation device with you is big and will help you if you do start to get tired when you're swimming. And if you're ever in doubt, as far as the roughness of the waves or if there's a rip current, don't go out. The ocean has been there for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and it will be there again tomorrow when the weather is better and the rip currents aren't quite as strong. And our weather service forecast in Wilmington can help you make those decisions on when the next best day to go out would be. So if we go to the next slide, here's some places that you can go for more information. The Weather Service has a lot of great information at weather.gov slash safety slash rip current. There's also some good information on the US Lifeguard Association's page on rip currents, as well as the North Carolina Sea Grant page also has some good rip current information there as well. And with that, I think that was the end of what we had to show. So again, if you had any questions, I think we did see some questions start to come in, but if you have any questions for us, feel free to chat them in the chat box and we can ask your questions here or answer your questions here. Or um, there's a raise your hand feature, right, Christina? That's a good way to get our attention. This is Christina speaking. I think if people can just enter them in the chat box, um, we'll go ahead and I'll, I'll go through and pull them out and repeat the question for everyone. And um, one of you three wonderful presenters can answer. And we don't have too many yet. Um, so please take a moment. Let's, let's take a little pause and give people a moment to think of a question to put in the box. Um, while people are doing that, there's something I forgot to mention earlier. And that is that um, following this webinar, a recording of the entire session will be emailed out to everyone. And I think it's also available on the National Weather Service's Wilmington YouTube channel. Um, but you should all get that in an email link. And now, okay, we have a few, let's see. Okay, now we have some questions coming in, so let's get started. The first question was, how long does a rip current exist in the ocean? Is it minutes or is it until the uh, there's a change in tide? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And sometimes they could be flash rip currents where they, they last only a matter of minutes. Sometimes they can be a little more resilient and last for 20 minutes or longer. Those rip currents that are tied to a structure maybe a revetment or a jetty or 
um, you know, peer type of thing, they can last even longer because that focus is always in place. So it, it varies, uh, but, but a lot of times they will pulse with the tides. They'll become more numerous and they'll become stronger, especially as we get towards low tide, a few hours either side of low tide. Okay, let's see, here's another one. Um... All right, another question someone had was, let's see if you can answer this. How prevalent are rip currents on any given day? Of course, I know it varies, but I never see them live. Um... Yeah, Mike, you want me to take that one? Yes, go ahead. Um, when, we, when we look at our statistics, and Vicki keeps phenomenal statistics about how many times we forecast a high risk or a moderate risk, and then we get reports back to us from our lifeguard partners, it seems like there's maybe a dozen times during the beach season where they're extremely dangerous, where we would have high risk in effect. Uh, maybe uh, a couple dozen days where it's a moderate risk, but most often than not, there's a low risk in effect. Uh, but they, there can be bad spells of them. Last year, like Vicki was talking about Hurricane Lorenzo, we actually had some other tropical systems producing swells too. And we had a very long period of rip current activity, September into October. Uh, but they're out there every day. It's just that they're not strong every day, which is fortunate for everybody. Okay, let's see. Um, so I'll, I'm, I'm going to do my best to um, repeat some of these questions, make sure I, I, I try to capture the essence of the question. Um, so someone asked, um, as a deaf person, how do I know if someone is in the um, ocean and screaming for help? Um, I will notice if their hands are waving. So maybe what do you commonly see when people are in distress? What are some things people might look for? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I would say to, if, if they don't look like they're having a good time, <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of people in the water are, are having a good time, maybe some horseplay or whatnot at the beach. But um, if, if they're looking like they're struggling, if they're waving their arms, if they're having a hard time staying afloat and they look like they're further out from shore than they should be from the normal, you know, if you scan the crowd and you see a normal distance that people are having fun and swimming and this person looks like they're out farther than they should be, that's probably a good indicator that they might be um, needing some help. Okay, next question. Do, do the does beach sands move um, from the waves if there's no rip current? Yeah, that's that's a great question too. Just the wave action on its own can move a tremendous amount of sand. Sometimes the sand is deposited down the beach after these weather systems move through. Sometimes big storms can carry and erode sand from the beach and deposit it farther offshore. And when it gets to be that bad that erosion that significant, that's where you see a lot of these beach communities during renourishment where they're bringing in sand or pumping in sand from uh, the offshore areas where it was directed by the storm. So you go, go to the beach day to day, it doesn't look like it's changed all that much, but it, it really does change significantly, especially after storms move through. And this is Mike speaking. Uh, a lot of times they change under the water where you can't see. Um, the, the, the turbulent currents and whatnot, um, you know, the beach, like Steve said, doesn't look like it's changed much, but under that ocean water, it can change quite a bit, especially after a big storm like a hurricane. All right, I think this next question is really great. I think it's a really good one. Um, can you be pulled into a rip current while in ankle deep water? For example, should I be concerned about, you know, little kids, young ones? that are not in very deep water. This is Mike speaking, a absolutely. Uh, it takes as little, uh, one of the things that we like to educate is about flash flooding. And uh, it can take as little as six inches of fast moving water 
to knock you off your feet and sweep you away. And the ocean's no different. If the current is moving fast enough in six inches of moving water, which would might be a little more than ankle height for some, I guess it depends on your height, but certainly for kids, um, it, it can definitely cause problems um, on, on the shoreline and, and take you out. So uh, if you're worried about your, your young ones, uh, make sure they have little floaties on or some kind of flotation device nearby that they can play with. And, um, and always keep an eye on them too. Um, if your friends and family are in the water, don't turn your back on them when they're playing, especially in the water or near the water. Always keep an eye on them just in case that might happen where they get taken out further than they would want to be. And I don't know if I heard you all um, mention this, but as far as you know, the surf conditions, I know you talked about where to go online to find that forecast, but if you you know, forgot and you're walking onto the beach, can you talk about, I don't know if this is universal on all beaches or if it just depends, but they have like a color system with the flags yeah. or, or various ways of showing. Yeah, they, uh, a lot of the uh, beaches will use a flag system and it's not just, or you might not just see a red flag for rip currents. There could be some sort of other hazard that is out there. Maybe a strong longshore current, one that, that flows down the beach uh, could be significant. Uh, but the flags me are pretty much are, are rated on a danger level. Certainly, we want to be keeping uh, an extra level of situational awareness on the beach when we see anything other than green. Okay, let's see. Um... What are some common mistakes that um, a person might make when they're trying, they're attempting to rescue someone from a rip current? You want me to get that, Mike? Go ahead, Steve. And this is not from any of my own experience, but just from working with the lifeguards over the last two decades, you know, when talking to them about it, uh, one of the big mistakes that someone makes going in trying to make a rescue is they don't bring any flotation with them. So by the time they swim all the way out to the victim and get to them, the victim is trying to keep their head above the water. So when you get out to them, they're going to inadvertently climb all over you to try and stay above the water and inadvertently push you under the water. If you notice the lifeguard pictures that we had showed, or if you're watching documentaries about lifeguards, they have that flotation can with them. They go in the water, they hand that cam can over to the person in distress so they don't pull the lifeguard underwater. So that I, I think that's the biggest mistake people make is um, they go in the water without flotation and they're in such a hurry, they don't take that second to pause to think about their options that they forget to call 911 or get help from someone else. So it's, it's usually a culmination of errors that lead to a bystander uh, drowning. Uh, so it's, it's and 20, like Vicki had said, 25% of our drownings in the Carolinas are that person trying to do the human thing, trying to rescue a family member, even someone they don't even know, but because they're not trained, they get them they get themselves in, into big trouble real quick because it's exhausting and it's uh, mentally uh, exhausting, physically exhausting. And if you're not prepared and don't have the training, it's usually not a good result. Um, someone asked, can there be, and I, and I think you, you might have touched on this earlier, but can there be two, three or more rip currents in, you know, a close, close proximity um, in one beach area? This is Mike. It's, it's not uncommon to have several on, on one beach strand in a given day um, in between sandbars or where the um, near shore sand changes in, in height with the sandbar there. So yes, you can definitely see several. Um, there are certain trouble spots. I think Steve hit on it earlier near jetties, near piers. They happen more often there. But um, yeah, when you're out walking the beach, you can encounter several, especially on the days that, um, that they're more, more likely. Um, and Steve, maybe this is a question for you, but someone I, I think was was hoping we could go back and, and look at some earlier slides, which I don't think that would be um, the thing to do right now. But you, um, do you want to talk about how people can request a copy of the PowerPoint and and let them know about the two versions that you have? 
Yeah, we, you know, in addition to the webinar link on our YouTube channel that you mentioned before, the presentation that we just showed now, we can have uh, available. In fact, I can attach it and send it to everybody as a PDF since it's not as terribly large as a PowerPoint file. And we also, if you, if you, when you get that email from me, and then email me back if you want a, a supplemental type of uh, presentation that has the uh, captioning descriptions uh, for the, the pictures, uh, then, we, then we can provide one. So if, if you know someone who is visually impaired that would like access to one that has the pictures with the picture descriptions, we would be glad that pro to provide that to you. And if for some reason someone needs it as a PowerPoint versus a PDF because of equipment that they might be using, they can just talk with you one-on-one -on -one about the best way to do that? Yes, and thanks for mentioning that too, because we can we can send it as a PowerPoint as well. We'll make it work. We'll make sure okay. that they get the information they need. Perfect. Thank you. All right, I think we have about uh, five, six, seven more questions, and I think we've got time. We good for time? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so someone asked, this is a very specific question, what do you recommend if you're caught in a rip current, but there is also a long shore current? You want that, Mike? <laughs> so you're caught in a rip current, but there's also a long shore current, is that correct? That's the question. So a long shore current goes parallel to the shore, but it's usually kind of close to the water's edge. So if you're caught in a rip current, it's going to pull you away from the longshore current that's closer to the, the beach front. So if you're in a rip current, that's pulling you further out to sea. You will escape that if you swim to the right or to the left further off the shore. But once you start swimming back with the help of waves pushing you back towards the beach front, there's a secondary uh, current there that could give you some trouble, and that's where the longshore current would come in. Um, it's usually, I mean, it depends on the day, I guess, but usually not quite as strong as a rip current, but you can fight your way through it. It'll move you sideways a little bit, but usually by that point, you're starting to hit some of the sand, and you can most likely stand up. Uh, someone wants to know that, let's see. If someone is um, struggling, you think in a rip current, and you want to try and give some assistance, you're a strong swimmer, even though that's not recommended, they want to know if it would be better to approach them from the side. As far as entering the water? I, I think, yeah, I think that's what the question is. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this, I, I know our friends with the United States Life Savings Association, you know, they're recommending don't go in the water to help someone unless you have flotation, um, all you're going to do is get yourself in trouble and there's no guarantees that you will be rescued in addition to the person that that you're rescuing. So it's it's I, I think it just starts with planning. You're going to the going to the beach, you know, there's rip currents, you know, there are other challenges. Like Mike mentioned before, you want to stay on top of everything with situational awareness, especially if you've got kids and family with you. And when I go to the beach, I always bring some sort of flotation with me. I'm not looking to make a rescue. My, my goodness, if, if, if I have no, no choice and someone's in distress, at least I would be able to throw them something that might float or in the worst case scenario, I had to go in the water. At least I had something that I can float on or hand to an individual that is in, in distress. This is Mike speaking. It's, it's, human nature to want to help and jump in, but your best three options are one, get a hold of the lifeguard, two, call 911, or three, throw them something, but don't go in the water yourself. Um, someone is asking about, um, does sort of the geography of the coast line um, in the Carolinas and beyond, affect frequency of rip currents. And so specifically they said, um, are rip currents any less frequent on the Crystal Coast beaches? So I think like Emerald Emerald Isle and, and that area, since they face the south rather than the east. Yeah, that's a great observation. I mean, there are different wave climates up and down the Carolinas and it's a function of the shape of the coast, but more so the adjacent bathymetry. 
bigger waves have a chance of forming across uh, areas north of Cape Fear than say the Grand Strand and farther south. Doesn't mean you can't get big waves there, but where you get the, the more frequent bigger waves, you have the more frequent stronger rip current events. And the Crystal Coast last year was absolutely devastated by rip current fatalities within a very short period of time. But a lot of that is a function of, of how the waves approach, the size of the waves, the wave period, and then the, the adjacent bathymetry and the configuration of the sandbar. So it's, it's very complex, but a good rule of thumb is where you have a bigger wave climate, you're more than likely gonna have stronger rip currents more frequently. Okay. Um, let's let's go with one more question, maybe two. I because th I some are I have some nice comments here. Thank you. Glad that you all have enjoyed this so far. Um, let's see. I think someone this question and I guess a quick a quick answer because I think you've touched on it a few times. But they they want to know recommend swimming with with a life vest or bringing flotation device out, especially with with little ones. I think you all have said that a few times. That's a yes. Okay. Okay. I think that it, all the other questions have pretty much been touched on already as you've already answered and they're kind of repeats. So again, thank, thank you everyone for joining us and thank you so much to Mike, Steve, and Vicki. Um, do any of you wish to um add any final comments before we uh sign off yes I, I unmuted myself this time so now you can hear me i i, I hope uh um but as as far as you know some of the things that we talked about um you know mike mike talked about getting a good view of rip currents from from up above and you know, he mentioned the dunes we're not encouraging you to walk on the dunes we're encouraging you to use that vantage point on the beach access paths between the dunes you know, stay where you need to stay. Don't don't destroy dunes or or any other habitat. Uh, but the higher up you are, the the better that you are. Uh, you know, keep in mind too that we can learn a lot from the statistics. As tragic as they are, we need to learn from them so we don't repeat them. And keep in mind too that uh, you know they're the most common hazard that you're going to come across when you go to the beach. You have a better chance of having an issue with a rip current than you are with a shark. So we need to stay focused on on what the the big challenges are and last of all i you know I, I can't thank you enough christina and the wilmington regional center for all of the work that you have done i greatly appreciate the efforts of crystal lynn and carmen for helping us with the interpretation and the captioning today you guys made this a wonderful event to be part of and i can't thank you enough for those efforts I have one person asking, saying I, I, I missed a question that they had. I'm not sure I understand it, but um, let me just, they, they did want to see if I, I could ask it and get it answered. But um, while you're looking there, Christina, this is Mike. If we didn't get to a question today, or if you wish, gosh, I would have asked a question, I wish I would have asked that question during the webinar, feel free to reach out to us after the fact. Uh, Steve loves questions. We can answer your questions after the fact. And uh, so don't feel like if we didn't get to you today, we won't reach you, so. And I think the, the person's sort of question or maybe even a suggestion is for, for a deaf swimmer, um, you know, maybe if they're swimming, if they're out swimming, could wear some type of wristband with, with maybe a, a flag on it. And I think that's so if you're, if you're waving for help, maybe that would, that would help your visibility as, as maybe you wouldn't, some other people maybe would be able to wave and scream. So that was yeah, a question, I guess, if you think that would be a good idea, that would be help, helpful for safety. Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. As long as it doesn't impede your ability to swim or remain afloat, uh, a flag versus a wristband, in other words. So certainly a bright colored wristband or, or something to get someone's attention. Uh, that, that's a very uh, great uh, point to make. Okay, thank you all again so much. And, and thank you everyone out there for joining us. And um feel free to send feedback to these guys um if you thought it was helpful maybe we can convince them to do some other kinds of webinars in the future you know hurricane uh, season is upon us so uh maybe i can rope them in for for some more opportunities great thanks everybody take care <laughs>